Number 1. The 34-year hunt for missing estate agent Susie Lamplett has taken a startling twist, with a former detective claiming to have unearthed compelling new evidence, contradicting the theory that she had ever arranged to meet the mysterious Mr. Kipper. Miss Lamplett, 25, disappeared in July 1986 after apparently arranging to show a client around a house that was for sale in Fulham, West London. In her office diary, she recorded details of a lunchtime appointment with a Mr. Kipper at a property in Shorrells Road. The police investigation centered on identifying this mystery man, and in 2002 Scotland Yard named convicted rapist and killer John Cannon as the key suspect. Last November they even began digging up Cannon's mother's garden in Sutton Coldfield in an ultimately fruitless search for her remains. But now, former Scotland Yard detective David Vidisette, who has spent three years investigating the disappearance, has suggested the entire inquiry was flawed from day one because Miss Lampla never actually visited Shorrells Road. He is now convinced the estate agent invented the appointment to cover her tracks with her bosses while she left the office unattended to go on a personal errand in work time. Mr. Vidisette, who has interviewed scores of witnesses and key figures involved in the original case, believes the police fixation with Mr. Kipper resulted in the missing or ignoring crucial pieces of evidence which point to the identity of the real killer. He is due to meet Scotland Yard detectives on Monday to present his evidence and is confident the killer could soon be caught. Mr. Vidisette spent 20 years with the Metropolitan Police specializing in counter-terrorism and organized crime. He was one of the key investigators on the July 7 London bombings and also helped crack Britain's biggest betting racket and the country's largest car crime ring. But he now works as a freelance investigator and author. Ahead of the meeting with Scotland Yard on Monday, Mr. Vidisette said, I began looking at this case three years ago as part of some work I was doing on serial killers. It was clear that the accepted narrative was that Susie had met her fate after meeting Mr. Kipper at the Shorrells Road address. Unfortunately that version of events became the accepted narrative and anything that did not fit with it was discounted by the original investigating team. By 2002 the investigation was entirely focused on finding evidence to prove that John Cannon was Mr. Kipper. But the more I looked into it the more I became convinced that something vital had been missed. I have spent three years tracing key witnesses from the time and there is compelling evidence that has convinced me that the infamous appointment at Shorrells Road at 12.45 p.m. on July 28, 1986 never took place. It is my firm view that Susie put the Mr. Kipper entry in her diary because she had to nip out to meet somebody else and she wasn't supposed to leave the office unattended. I believe the answer to this mystery lies in another appointment that Susie did keep, but that has never been explored. One of the main reasons police were convinced Miss Lampla had met with Mr. Kipper at the Shorrells Road address was that a witness living in a neighboring property claimed to have seen a man and woman standing outside around the time of the appointment. Harry Riglin, who has since passed away, gave detectives a detailed description of the man which led to a photo fit being produced and circulated. But Mr. Vidisette has tracked down Mr. Riglin's nephew, who said while his uncle had taken notice of the man, he had never really been clear that the woman was Miss Lampla. Other witnesses who put the estate agent and the mystery man at the scene only came forward after a television reconstruction was broadcast a week after the disappearance, and Mr. Vidisette believes their testimony is not reliable. Another key piece of evidence that the former detective claims was overlooked at the time includes the existence of the keys to the Shorrells Road property. Mr. Vidisette claims the estate agency that Miss Lampla worked for only had one set of keys to the Shorrells Road property, and these were recovered from the office by the police after she went missing. He explained, It is not clear how this was overlooked in the original investigation, but I imagine police at the time just assumed there was a second set of keys that Susie had with her, which were never found. But I tracked down several estate agency employees and the original owner of the estate agency, all of whom said if there had been a second set of keys, they would have been on the same keyring. Susie didn't have the keys with her because she never intended on conducting the house viewing at Shorrells Road. I firmly believe that when she wrote in her office diary that she was going to meet Mr. Kipper at Shorrells Road, she was in fact going to meet someone else. Mr. Vidisette is hoping the extensive dossier of evidence he has compiled will give Scotland Yard enough information to arrest the real killer. Miss Lampla's family never gave up hope of finding out what happened to her and set up a trust in her name that campaigns to protect the victims of violence, aggression and stalking. Sadly her mother, Diane, died in 2011 aged 79, and her father, Paul, passed away last year aged 87. Number 2.
It's called the Village of the Damned, and it's one of the most mysterious ghost towns in America. Dudleytown is a ghost town, located in northwestern Connecticut within the town of Cornwall. Many unexplained events, mysterious disappearances and ghost sightings reported in this small town. According to local legend, the founders of Dudleytown were descended from Edmund Dudley, an English nobleman who was beheaded for treason during the reign of Henry VII. From that moment on, the Dudley family was placed under a curse, which followed them across the Atlantic to America. The name of Dudleytown was given at an unknown date to a portion of Cornwall that included several members of the Dudley family. All Dudleys can trace their heritage back to a Saxon named Dud, who was titled Duke of Mercia and died in 725 AD. It was Dud's land that would eventually become the site of the Dudley Castle. An old English word for land was Lee, so the area was called Dud's Lee. Many centuries later, when the taking of a surname became necessary, some people took a name based on their occupation, such as Smith or Baker, and others took their surname based on the land they came from, i.e., Dudley. The area that became known as Dudleytown was settled in the early 1740s by Thomas Griffiths, followed by Gideon Dudley, and, by 1753, Barzillai Dudley and Abiel Dudley, Martin Dudley joined them a few years later. Other families also settled there. The story about the curse has been traced to an English nobleman, ancestor of the Dudley brothers who settled the town. Back in England, old Edmund Dudley got his head chopped off for plotting against King Henry VII. Someone or something put a curse on Edmund that followed his family to the New World and took root in Dudleytown. In what is often cited as the first manifestation of the curse, one of the Dudley brothers went insane. Other strange incidents. At a barn raising, a man fell to his death. Lightning struck and killed a Dudleytown woman, right on her porch. Several residents of Dudleytown are also said to have gone insane, and two local women, Mrs. Greeley, better known as Mary Cheney and Harriet Clark, is said to have hanged herself in Dudleytown in 1872, the latter having reported visions of demons prior to her death. Following the Civil War, Dudleytown slowly became a ghost town. Residents of the town left for better places where they had access to more things. However, John Brophy decided to keep his family there, even though everyone else had left. These would prove to be a fatal mistake. Brophy saw his entire life change within just a few short months. His wife died, and immediately after the funeral, his only two children walked into the woods and seemingly disappeared. His house then caught fire mysteriously, and Brophy finally disappeared himself. Following the last resident's death, Dr. Clark purchased a large plot of land in the area and officially became the owner of Dudleytown, or at least what was left of Dudleytown. Legend claims that the man left his wife there for a few days and returned to find her completely insane. After screaming about the creatures in the woods, she killed herself in their house. A few years later the man remarried and built a new house for his bride. Together with a group of their friends, the couple formed the Dark Entry Forest Association. With trees and forests being destroyed across the country, they hoped to preserve the land here. Clark and his second wife died during the 1940s, but their descendants still live nearby. Rev. Gary P. Dudley, a Texas resident and the author of The Legend of Dudleytown. Solving Legends Through Genealogical and Historical Research, Heritage Books, 2001, disputes these accounts of the troubled town. In tracing the genealogy of his name, he found virtually no historical basis for Dudleytown's cursed reputation no genealogical link to Edmund Dudley, no mysterious illnesses or deaths. As for Mary Cheney, he says she never set foot in Dudleytown. Now the Dark Entry Forest Association owns the land, and entry is no longer permitted. There is a warning note from the Connecticut State Police. Those who go, or attempt to go to Dudleytown, will be arrested for trespassing and or parking. The fines start at $75 per person and rapidly increase. Susie didn't have the keys with her because she never intended on conducting the house viewing at Shorrells Road. I firmly believe that when she wrote in her office diary that she was going to meet Mr. Kipper at Shorrells Road, she was in fact going to meet someone else. Mr. Vitaset is hoping the extensive dossier of evidence he has compiled will give Scotland Yard enough information to arrest the real killer. Miss Lampla's family never gave up hope of finding out what happened to her and set up a trust in her name that campaigns to protect the victims of violence, aggression and stalking. Sadly her mother, Diane, died in 2011 aged 79, and her father, Paul, passed away last year aged 87. Number 3 In the Nahani National Park of Northwest Canada lies the Nahani River. The area is only accessible by boat or plane and is home to many natural wonders, such as sinkholes, geysers and a waterfall, almost double the size of Niagara Falls. 
Lord Tweed's Muir, John Butcham, author of The 39 Steps, once said of the valley. It's a fancy place that old-timers dream about. Some said the valley was full of gold, and some said it was hot as hell, owing to the warm springs. It had a wicked name too, for at least a dozen folks went in and never came out. Indians said it was the home of devils. The 200-mile gorge has become infamous due to a number of gruesome deaths and many disappearances, earning itself the eerie name, the Valley of the Headless Men. Anomalies first began in 1908, when the McLeod brothers came prospecting for gold in the valley. Nothing was heard or seen of the brothers for a whole year until their decapitated bodies were found near a river. Nine years later, the Swiss prospector Martin Jorgensen was next to succumb to the valley when his headless corpse was found. In 1945, a miner from Ontario was found in his sleeping bag with his head cut from his shoulders. While skeptics of an unknown power at work in the valley would put the grisly mutilations down to feuding gold prospectors or hostile Indians, there are other strange happenings in the area, which add to the valley's mysteriousness. The fiercely renowned Naha tribe simply vanished from the area a few years prior to the first deaths. Other Indians of the area have avoided the valley for centuries, claiming an unknown evil haunts it. Many parts of the valley remain unexplored, and there are tales the valley holds an entrance to the hollow earth. Others believe the valley is home to a lost world, with lush greenery and a tropical climate, due to the hot springs generating warm air, as well as untapped gold mines and wandering sasquatches. While a haven for Bigfoot remains unlikely, one thing is for certain, something strange lurks in the Nahani Valley. The eerie nickname attached to 200 Mile Gorge comes from a series of unexplained incidents in the gorge during the gold rush of the early 20th century. Two brothers, Willie and Frank McLeod, left in 1906 in an attempt to reach the Klondike through Nahani. Nothing was heard from them for the next two years. Rumors spoke of the two finding the mother load of gold. Despite this, no efforts were made to find them. In 1908, another prospecting expedition discovered two bodies, later identified as the McLeod brothers. Both had been decapitated. This incident would likely have been marked up as just another macabre tale of North, had they been the only headless bodies. In 1917, the body of a Swiss prospector by the name of Martin Jorgensen was found next to his burned cabin. Decapitated. In 1945, the body of a miner from Ontario, whose name seems to be lost to history, was found in his sleeping bag, without a head. A trapper named John O'Brien was found frozen next to his campfire, matches still clutched in his hand. I cannot find any reference to the state of his head. Theories abound as to what happened to these men, and others, up to 44 people are said to have disappeared there. Some put these attacks down to grizzly bears, some feuding prospectors, others natives. Some say the area is naturally heated by hot springs and is practically a tropical paradise, a Shangri-La if you will, with the valley floor covered in gold nuggets. These theories often speak of the valley being a haven for the Sasquatch. Some even claim the valley is an entrance to the hollow earth. My view lies somewhere in between all these. I believe that the native Naha people discovered this sheltered valley and settled there. Theoretically, food would be plentiful if the valley is the veritable paradise described in some reports. These people then likely became highly territorial over their lands and killed any trespassers. The decapitation is reminiscent of certain other tribal practices designed to instill fear in their enemies. Another theory is that this terrifying folklore was spread by those in the Nahani region to further dissuade more white men searching for gold on their land. These stories soon infected the prospector camps and those who had recently arrived to the area. Number 4 Anjakuni Lake can be found deep in the Kivalig region of rural Nunavut in Canada. Nestled along the Kazan River, it is a fine spot for trout and pike fishing, both of which are plentiful in the waters of the area. Anjakuni quickly became the established home to an Inuit tribe that grew into a colony and became famous almost overnight on a cold November day in 1930. Joe LaBelle was a Canadian fur trapper and an experienced one at that. He was a more than capable outdoorsman and was well acquainted with the area. He knew that the Inuit had formed a community and he had visited them on occasions in the past. LaBelle was familiar with the Inuit tales of wood spirits that were allegedly malicious and that this remote part of Canada was also steeped in the legends of the Wendigo. Despite this, the Inuit tribe were a friendly people and would always welcome passing travelers and offer them a bed for the night. LaBelle normally had very little cause to feel gripped by fear or anxiety, but this particular night at Anjakuni Lake proved to be different. The full moon that was overhead cast an eerie illumination across the village. Nothing was moving. The army of huskies that were normally boisterous with the arrival of visitors was strangely quiet as well. 
The only sounds that LaBelle could hear were his own snowshoes and the hollow echo of his greeting. A frontier man such as LaBelle would immediately understand that something was terribly amiss. He began to investigate upon entering the village. The normal signs of life were completely absent. No laughter or the hubbub of conversation was detected. Even worse was the total lack of smoke emanating from chimneys that indicated the presence of life. LaBelle did notice that a fire had been started off in the distance and made his way toward it. The fire itself looked as though it had been burning for a considerable time. On closer inspection, LaBelle discovered that someone had begun the preparations for a meal but never finished. The stew was ruined. LaBelle continued onwards further into the village, still hopeful of bumping into someone that may explain precisely what had happened. Now rampant, Joe began to physically examine the homes of the tribe to determine if there was a hint or clue as to what might have caused them to up and leave. Unfortunately, no answers were forthcoming. Some of the discoveries he made were telling. Many homes were well stocked with food and weapons. In one location, LaBelle found another badly burned meal. In another, he found a discarded repair of a junior sealskin that had yet to be completed. While there was no definitive answer regarding what had taken place, it must surely have been a sudden event that was widespread and affected all 30 men, women and children in the village. LaBelle found no signs of a struggle, but did find many items that a departing group would have required to bring with them. Food, arms, and clothing had all been abandoned. Further investigations led to a pair of discoveries that chilled the blood of even this hardened veteran. As far as he was able to tell, whatever took place was quite a recent occurrence. He had exhausted all fruitless efforts to find someone within the village. The bewildered trapper instead considered where they might have ended up going. Scanning the terrain in and around the village, he found no fresh tracks in the snow aside from his own. The most gruesome discovery he made was the reason for the absence of the dogs. Every single one of them had starved to death. This was more than enough to convince him to continue onwards to the closest telegraph office located several miles further on. That did mean LaBelle would have to ignore basic necessities such food and shelter, but he was eager to leave the eerie village and retrieve help. Once LaBelle reached the telegraph office, he reported his encounter, and he insisted the mounted police, RCMP, launch an official investigation. En route to the village, the RCMP noticed an isolated shack that belonged to another trapper called Armand Laurent and his two sons. When questioned, they said they saw a large cylindrical object that transformed into a bullet shape before heading toward Anjakuni Lake. Unconfirmed reports also claimed that when the RCMP actually reached the village, they found that every grave in the burial ground had been opened and emptied. The headstones had been neatly stacked in piles on either side of the graves, ruling out animals as the culprits. The RCMP conducted an intense and thorough investigation, but could not produce one credible reason as to what had happened. What little leeway they made just led to even more questions that only served to deepen the mystery. It was their conclusion that the Inuit people had been missing for about eight weeks prior to LaBelle's arrival. Using that as accurate, then how had the dogs managed to starve so quickly? There was time for burning food to be discovered, and the dogs themselves were a vital tool for the tribe as a whole. It seems inconceivable that they would intentionally cause harm or distress to the animals. And if they had been missing for two months, who lit the fire that LaBelle found smoldering? This is one mass disappearance, much like the Roanoke colony, that will most likely never be solved. Number 5 The Kabenheven was built for the Danish East Asiatic Company in 1921, when it was launched it was the world's largest sailing ship. Its sails stood over five stories high. From 1921 to 1928 the ship made nine voyages, visiting nearly every continent and completing two circumnavigations. On September 21, 1928, the Kabenheven departed from Nora Sundby in northern Jutland for Buenos Aires on its tenth, and ultimately final, voyage. The captain was the very experienced Hans Andersen, 75 persons were aboard, including 26 crew and 45 cadets. The goal was to unload a shipload of chalk and bagged cement in Buenos Aires, take on another load of cargo and sail for Melbourne, and then bring a shipment of Australian wheat back to Europe. The Kabenheven arrived at Buenos Aires on November 17, 1928. The cargo was unloaded quickly. The ship's departure was delayed as there were no paying commissions to take cargo to Australia, and a solution was hard to find. Finally, on December 14, almost a month after arriving in Buenos Aires, Captain Anderson decided to ship out for Australia without a cargo. The voyage was expected to take 45 days. On December 22 the Kabenhavn exchanged radio messages with the Norwegian steamer William Bloomer, 
indicating they were about 900 miles from Tristan da Cunha and that all is well. The bloomer attempted to contact Akabenhaven again later that night, to no avail. Due to the length of the voyage to Australia and the fact that Anderson routinely went long periods without sending a message, the Danish were not initially worried about the silence from the ship. However, as months passed without word they became concerned and in April 1929, the Danish East Asiatic Company dispatched a motor vessel, the Mexico, to Tristan da Cunha to search for the Cabenham. They received reports that a large five-masted ship with its foremast brokenness is seen on January 21, 1929, however it had not attempted to come inland. The Mexico, joined by the British Royal Navy, searched for the Cabenhaven for several months, but found no sign. The Danish government declared the ship and its crew were lost at sea. For the next few years after the Cabenhaven's disappearance, there were a number of sightings of a mysterious five-masted ship fitting its description, seen adrift in the Pacific. In July 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter sighted a five-masted phantom ship during a gale. The captain took their statements and wondered if this was the Wraith of the Copenhagen. Further sightings came in the following weeks and months from Easter Island and across the Peruvian coast. Later some wreckage, including a piece of stern bearing the name Cabenham, reportedly was found off West Australia. Number 6 William Cantello claimed he was born around 1838 in the Isle of Wight. He first came to notice as an advanced engineer who developed many strange and unidentified objects around the 1870s. By this time, he owned a curiosity shop on French Street in Southampton. At that time he was also the landlord of the Old Tower Inn. Beneath the pub was a tunnel where Cantello spent much of his time turning it into an underground workshop. Visitors to this workshop made claims of seeing strange light machines humming globes and odd weapons. It also said that Cantello would often enter the tunnel and not be seen again for days or even weeks on end. Cantello used the tunnel underneath the old tower in for his experiments and was later joined by his two sons, both engineers themselves. Locals reported hearing noises coming from the vicinity, but the family kept their work a closely guarded secret. In early 1880 Cantello announced that he had developed a groundbreaking machine gun. Accounts differ regarding the actual events of Cantello's disappearance late in 1880, some reports say that he went for an extended holiday on his own as a reward for his hard work but was never to return. Others claim he was last seen entering his tunnel and vanished in a puff of smoke and flash of lights. It is also claimed that a large sum of Cantello's money had been transferred out of his bank account after his disappearance. Cantello's family tried to find William, but with no real success. They employed a private investigator who claimed he traced him to America, but could not find out anything more or provide evidence. Hiram Maxim was an American inventor who appeared in the United Kingdom in 1881, claiming to be 41. With him he brought a number of new and mysterious inventions, including a groundbreaking machine gun. The Maxim gun the first portable, fully automatic machine gun. He also submitted patents on mechanical devices such as a fire sprinkler, mousetrap, hair curling irons, and steam pumps and more. Maxim laid claim to inventing the light bulb, providing convincing evidence. He even experimented with powered flight well before planes existed and submitted science papers claiming that he had developed teleportation technology. Cantello's two sons happened across a photograph of Maxim, whose similarity to their father led them to believe that he was still alive and had assumed a new identity. Descriptions of the gun also sounded similar to the one they had worked on, and they set out to investigate. The sons tried to challenge Maxim, but he wanted nothing to do with them, claiming by letter that he was from America and not the Isle of Wight. This only led the sons to believe Maxim was in fact their father, as nobody outside of the immediate family knew they originated from the Isle of Wight. He refused to meet the boys. With good evidence to support Maxim's previous life in the USA, along with his papers claiming that he had developed a way to transport himself from one place to another, the sons bell of their father had been living a double life and teleporting himself backwards and forwards. BBC's Steve Punt investigated Cantello's disappearance and the son's claims. He discovered that Maxim had complained about a man who was impersonating him in America. He also showed a photograph of Cantello next to his machine gun to the Royal Armouries, who stated that the weapon appeared to be exactly the same as the Maxim gun. A facial expert who compared the images of Cantello and Maxim highlighted that there were some visible differences between the two men, but also some similarities. Number 7 Pauline Picard was two years old in April 1922 when she went missing from her family home in Goa's Aulutu, France. 
a thorough search was conducted by local police and volunteers that amounted no results. Many believed she had been kidnapped by a local caravan of gypsies and ferried off without a trace. The situation seemed bleak when, a few weeks later, word came that a young girl matching Pauline's description had been found wandering alone in Cherbourg, over 300 miles away from where Pauline had originally been reported missing. Her mother identified her via a photograph and the police officer who found her was satisfied it was the same girl. The mystery of how a toddler could find herself several hundred miles away from home was brushed aside in the wake of relief of her safe return. The parents traveled to retrieve their daughter, but the blissful reunion was not without its oddities. The girl was very distant with her apparent parents. Even more baffling, she did not respond when spoken to in her native Breton dialect. Her overjoyed parents chalked it up to trauma and returned to go as Alaludu with their now recovered daughter and all seemed set right. In fact, newspapers across France and even as far as the New York Times reported the strange but the miraculous return of the missing child. However, just weeks after returning home, the Picards began to suspect the girl was not actually their daughter. During this period, another local farmer, Yves Martin, asked the parents point-blank if they thought the girl was truly their daughter before exclaiming God help me, I am guilty and running off. The man was committed to an asylum and never heard from again. And then a discovery was made that turned the Picard's world upside down once more. A neighboring farmer was walking across the Picard farm when he found something truly disturbing. The body of a very young girl, decapitated, brutally disfigured, and naked with a skull nearby. The man went to the police who went to investigate the site along with the Picards. The body was damaged and decaying past the point of identification, but Pauline's mother noted the clothes found nearby matched the outfit Pauline had been wearing the day she vanished. Stranger still, the location where the remains had been found had already been searched during the initial canvassing of the area, which led investigators to believe the body had had only recently been moved there. Things became even more bizarre when the autopsy on the skull found near the body was found it was too large to have belonged to the young girl they'd discovered. In fact, the skull didn't even belong to a woman, it was the skull of an unidentified full-grown male. This opened the case even wider, now there were two victims with a kidnapper and potential murderer still on the loose somewhere in the area. Ultimately, and tragically, no conclusion could be reached in the case that seemed to have a never-ending list of questions. Was the hysterical man who questioned Pauline Parents her killer? Did he kill the man to whom the skull belonged? Or did the skull belong to Pauline's killer? Who then were the parents of the girl from Cherbourg, and how could the Picards have so grossly misidentified her? Sadly, no answers could be found. In fact, even with the Picards' identification of her clothes, there was still have no proof that the body found on their property was actually Pauline's. The young girl from Cherbourg was sent back to be put in an orphanage, and the Picards spent the rest of their days with the mystery of their daughter's fate. It is possible that answers lie in the strange emotions of grief and mourning. After all, Mrs. Picard could have very well simply wished too hard that the Cherbourg girl was her daughter and found herself willing to ignore the obvious holes in that theory. Our crazed local man, Eves Martin, is still considered the prime suspect by many, though his ultimate fate after entering the asylum was never known. As for the most mysterious part of this? The skull was never identified, and no missing men were postulated as possible identities. This is not the only time in history that mistaken identity and an apparent amnesia of native language has baffled the public. Anna Anderson, ironically during that same year in 1922, was identified as the missing Grand Duchess Anastasia, despite apparent language barriers to controversial opinions and an ultimate public refusal of the woman's claims. Today most accept at this point the body located on the property was Pauline's, the identity of the owner of the disembodied head remains a mystery. And as for the strange doppelganger from Cherbourg? She too has been lost to the pages of history.